trying to get this name right. And Rose and I laughed about it because she thought of the name, she thought of the word trigger to help with the trig. For me, I thought of trigonometry to help with the, the trig part of your name. So uh, it's a great example of the math geek that I am. So um, you, I've had the um, pleasure of being able to view your slides. So I know that you have a really great introduction, uh, introductory slide. So why should I introduce you, uh, introduce you when you can do that yourself? No one knows you better than you. Um, but I will say that I think everybody will be in for a treat today and I look forward to everything that you have to say. So I pass the floor over to you. Great, well, thanks for having me. Let me do a quick sound check. If I could get uh, some thumbs up on the screen if it's coming through, okay. We are hearing you well. Great, wonderful. Well, thanks for that uh, introduction. Uh, Trigger was one of my nicknames when I was younger growing up. So you've uh, picked up on that for sure. That was easier than for Trigstead for most. So I did grow up in a, a small town in, in, in Iowa, uh, a somewhat large town for Iowa at the time was uh, 4,250 people. Um, but I grew up you know, in and around uh, a, a very rural area uh, equidistant between Des Moines and Minneapolis, uh, two hours to the nearest major airport, uh, where um, you know the healthcare system was essentially the couple of primary care providers in town, the local pharmacy uh, and EMS. Right, that's your healthcare system, and you could drive you know 40, 45 miles over to Mason City if you needed an actual hospital bed. And so I, I sort of grew up with this community-based model, small business, local, people know each other model um, of, of living. Uh, I, I then uh, uh, went to Drake University uh, and I ran track there, which meant summers on campus, which meant made all the sense in the world just to do the farm MBA <laughs> because I was already there in the summers. And so uh, had that opportunity, which was a great opportunity. And, and it really piqued my interest. I actually started off in a lab, published a couple of papers on uh, pharmaceutics, uh, and then got into some of the MBA classes later in my um, didactic coursework. And it really got me interested in economics and policy. So then I go to, to uh, North Carolina to do, a, after I graduate, uh, uh, work part-time nights and weekends in a pharmacy while I'm in grad school. And really before I even took my first class, uh, because uh, grad school is about publishing a, a thesis or a, or a dissertation at some point, I was introduced to uh, Community Care of North Carolina before I took my first class and they said, this is what you'll end up writing your dissertation on. So I spent the next four years learning about econometrics and, and uh, research methods and policy and those types of things, all the while, while I'm working in this um, Patient Center Medical Home Model Accountable Care Organization Clinically Integrated Network of what amounts to greater than at the time greater than 95% of all primary care providers and in, in uh, I think the 12th or 13th largest state in the country so it was quite a privilege uh, they had, they knew they wanted to do something with pharmacy this was 2002 which was a long time ago trust me when it comes to uh, including pharmacists and pharmacies in your thinking about how you implement primary care. And we've come a long, long ways. They knew they wanted to do something. They knew they, the, 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 they needed some expertise, but they didn't know what to do. So I had the privilege of coming in and saying, okay, well, here's some things we could potentially work on. And we certainly did some things in and around you know, drug selection, but we started embedding pharmacists with care managers and we started embedding pharmacists with practices um, at the hospital with the behavioral health and the hospitalists uh, out in the community. Um, and we did really a lot of cool things under what we call the Pharmacy Home Project. And I kind of swore off community pharmacy. Uh, you know, I was practicing nights and weekends, enjoyed that, um, felt like I was pretty good at not making mistakes and counseling and those types of things. But I never really considered community pharmacy as a key component to the patient center medical home. Uh, but then interestingly, 15 years later, or uh, 2017 on, on this timeline, actually, I answered to a board of 72 physicians, because uh, it's very much kind of an association like model, or was, and they were the ones that came and said, hey, you know, we're doing every kind of thing with pharmacy, but why aren't we working with community pharmacies in this patient center medical home model? 
And I thought to myself, well, that's kind of on the hard pile. I don't know that they're all that ready for it. Uh, and I don't know that it's scalable, but I'm a good soldier. Yes, sir, sirs and ma'ams, and uh, we'll go ahead and, and, and do it. And um, very first data point um, that sort of took me aback was we looked at, uh, we, did, we were doing 40,000 home visits in a quarter with what we call the uh, heavy and medium care managed patients, really complex patients. And I said, you know, to the data folks, run a, run a report for me on how many providers each one of these patients touches in a year. And they were with our primary care providers three and a half visits a year. They were in the pharmacy 35 times a year. And that statistics actually rolled downhill to some studies. And, and, and it's kind of one of the most important statistics, I think, for community pharmacy that's kind of gotten out there into the lexicon and people in my world is, this idea that, oh, if we're gonna be interacting with a population, boy, the pharmacy is the most frequently touched, best opportunity to screen, refer, get people engaged, um, see how check in with folks and, and, and just from a pure um, frequent touching perspective. So that was an aha for me, uh, being so invested in patient-centered medical home and still am on embedded pharmacists and health systems, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, um, uh, you know, putting pharmacists there, but it was sort of like, wow, you know, if I put my public health hat on, which half of my classes were in public health, anytime you can touch a population that frequently, frequently across an entire population, you ought to be looking at something closely. And we're seeing that now with COVID vaccinations, right? The majority of COVID vaccinations as we sit here today and boosters are out of a community pharmacy, right? That's a, that's a big change over 20 years. Uh, pharmacies can touch populations quickly and efficiently. The second one was when I was when I would talk with um, uh, folks, I would say, well, yeah, but how hard is it going to be to integrate with these patient-centered medical homes, right? Because phew, that seems on the hard pile, right? It's one thing to put a pharmacist into practice, they're employed or they're contracted, they're in there, they're meeting and seeing each other face to face. But you know, how, how much do folks really want to work with a community pharmacy in this model? And what's interesting is if you go out to the people that actually take care of patients, they have a different perspective than administrators, <laughs> is what I found. So what I did is I went out to the medical directors, frontline folks, care management directors, uh, behavioral health directors within that system in North Carolina. I said, look, crazy idea. What if the, com the community pharmacies started care managing patients with you? You were on each other on call. You shared care plans, these types of integrated stuff that sounds hard and and uh, really relationship oriented. If you, crazy idea, if you think, you know, you might wanna work with a pharmacy in this project that we're rolling out here called uh, Community Pharmacy Enhanced Services Network, give us the name of that pharmacy and we'll see what happens. Five business days later, I got a list of 100, uh, 174 different pharmacy names and I was shocked. So I started calling some of these folks like, well, what do you think about community pharmacy? Well, you know, I, I'd like to work with all of them, but it's kind of hard for a lot of reasons, and I'm not quite sure we can integrate very easily. And then I'd say, well, what about Moose Pharmacy? Oh, Joe's great. We send all of our difficult patients there. They take care of us when we need something special done with a pharmacy. I go out east. Hey, Dr. Robinson, uh, what do you think about community pharmacy? Uh, you know, sounds like an okay idea, but I, I don't know. Uh, well, what about Ashley Abode and Relo out there? Do you want to work with? Oh, yeah, they're great. Ashley's great. They're great. We send all of our difficult patients. They fix problems for us when we run into things we need done. And what we found was uh, 139 of the 147 pharmacy names that were submitted to us, not by pharmacy, but by the care team members, were independent pharmacies. Uh, four were FQHC and four were health system pharmacies because, you know, these were folks that were in a health system going, oh, I'd like to work with my own pharmacies. So that was really, really telling. And what had happened was nobody had ever strung all these folks together in a way that could work with the healthcare team, right? So it was a lot of these individual relationships that hadn't been networked. So I had 1,200 care managers in the field that I was responsible for med management types of activities. And if we were going to do a transitions of care program out of UNC Health to 100 different counties in North Carolina, because they discharge everywhere, there needs to be a common way of making a referral and onboarding. And nobody had ever sort of said, you know, hey, Joe, you're great. You do amazing things. But by yourself, you have no value to the large system. Blue Cross Blue Shield doesn't care about one pharmacy or five pharmacies, no matter how good they are. But if there's two or 300 Moose pharmacies and they're all operating 
under a similar protocol, now you've got something. And that's what we learned. And that kind of started this whole journey for uh, CPSN. We started working with CMS, CMMI, ONC, all the federal stuff coming out of the Affordable Care Act. And, and we started getting phone calls from across the country. Hey, how do we do this in our neck of the woods? Half of those calls would come from kind of pharmacies or pharmacy organization. The other half would come from plans, physician groups, public health departments uh, saying, hey, we want to we, we, we want to do something with community pharmacy. We just don't know how, and we don't know what how we establish that relationship or, or what it looks like. But yeah, we would love to work with the local community pharmacy is what we found. So that set me on my journey. Today, I'm the executive director at CPSN USA. And I think my greatest privilege is twofold. One, I get to work with a lot of small businesses and that holds a place in my heart from where I kind of grew up with. Um, but also that I actually get to use all the skill sets from, you know, the equivalent of 12 years of college, <laughs> right? So I get the business part, the program evaluation part, value-based design part, and I still get to practice and, and uh, you know, work on figuring out how we, what the next generation of, of pharmacy practice looks like. So what I want to present to you in the remaining, I guess it would be, oh, 45 minutes is sort of an overview of where community pharmacy is through the lens of the ACT program and CPSN. The ACT program is an academic uh, CPSN transformation collaborative. So there's 93 schools signed up with that, basically saying, hey, let's revisit community pharmacy. Let's not write it off. Let's think about what uh, pharmacy, community pharmacy 2.0 might look like. And um, let's maybe make some uh, investments in it and start to, to not think about trying to save the old way of doing things, but actually support maybe the new way of doing things. And, and, and I want to walk through that with you today to sort of update you where we think the world is at and where we think the world is going. And we're not the only actor out there, which is good progress, right? So CPSN is now one of en many entities, I think, uh, emerging, trying to figure out a different way to get paid. Joe Moose would say to me all the time, Troy, we're not trying to get paid more. Um, you know, this was 10 years ago and now they're getting paid a lot less. But he said, we don't want to get paid more. We want to get paid differently. And that resonated with me because that's exactly what primary care providers have been saying since 1967, when the Academy of, of Pediatrics said, hey, we need to do this thing called patient-centered medical home. And they couldn't get anybody to do it until the business model changed, right? You don't, you know, that's the key, key thing. And I think the market is changing and that's, that's what holds hope for changing community pharmacy practice. So myth number one, community pharmacies are expensive to operate. Uh, I can tell you as a trained person in health economics, this is not the case at all. I think pharmacies get unfairly pulled into the vortex of runaway drug costs, which are mostly specialty at this point. 2% of all fills last year were 50% of the cost of drugs and specialty and community pharmacies generally don't even dispense those drugs anymore. They're kind of left out of that game. Uh, two to three, maybe five years from now, it could be 3% of fills or 70% of the cost. Again, having really nothing to do with community pharmacy care delivery and operations. All right. So when you actually break this down, this slide is drawn to scale. So we spent $3.6 trillion on healthcare last year, all in. $3.6 trillion is 3.6 million millions. The human brain struggles beyond six digits. Okay seven at most. That's why we split up social security numbers and phone numbers into dashes, by the way. Uh, so 36 million millions, let that sink in. 347 billion, okay, or 347,000, all right, millions, is what we spend post rebate on drugs. It's actually still less than 10% of what we spend in the entire healthcare system, which is lower than other countries, by the way, as a proportion of the total spend, importantly. Yes, we pay a lot of money for drugs and perhaps too much money, but as a proportion of the whole, the rest of the system is more egregious in their overpricing and overspending than drugs, okay? So don't let anybody even tell you that we, that we uh, pay more as a proportion of our total cost in drugs than other, and the, the other OECD countries. We don't, as a general rule. Still might pay too much for drugs, but as a proportion of the whole, okay? When you look at retail, you net out the VA, you net out uh, like Part B infusions, those types of things. Now we're at 242 billion. When you look at community pharmacies, so you net out mail order, those types of things, you're looking at 60,000 community pharmacies in the country. 
okay? Dollars in, dollars out, 156 billion. But that's not the matter that uh, the number that matters. The number that matters is what's after you buy a product and it goes out the door. In other words, what does it take to operate a pharmacy? Okay, so if I sell a drug for a hundred bucks and I bought it for 80, it takes 20 bucks to keep that pharmacy open if it's a viable reimbursement. Okay, so the, the gross on the margin generally in community pharmacy is about 20% right now. That tells me it takes $31.2 billion to keep 61,000 pharmacies open. The building, the lights, the labor, the, the, the bottle, the cash register, everything about the pharmacy, it only takes $31.2 billion to operate that essential infrastructure. That's less than 1% of the entire healthcare spend or about one quarter of our inflation. So in other words, if you just eliminated every pharmacy out there and there was no harm done, that's a separate issue. If you eliminated every pharmacy out there and they closed tomorrow, that would be made up by general healthcare inflation in less than a quarter, okay? Pharmacy is not expensive. And then we look at MTM spend, 100 million, even 200 million, 0.003%. Um, nothing incensed me more than when we had one of our associations come back and say, you know what, the CBO scored provider status and it was too expensive. It was 10 or $15 billion. And I said, it needs to be 30 and that's not that much money. Just because it says a billion, a billion is, is budget dust, okay, when it comes to global healthcare spend. It's not that much money, okay? To keep 240,000 pharmacists out there doing good work does not cost that much money. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Community pharmacy labor markets are isolated and self-contained. Uh, this is annoying myth number two, and I've lived on all sides of pharmacy. In fact, my dissertation was actually in long-term care pharmacy through community care. And then I migrated to PCMH and then over to community pharmacy. We have 177,000 pharmacists right now working in community pharmacies. And COVID's had a very interesting effect. We'll talk about that in a bit here. Um, but prior to COVID and prior to a lot of uh, testing and vaccine administration where there's a lot of service dollars coming in, okay, the going rate for a vaccine administration is 40 bucks. I have uh, over 100 pharmacies that have done over 8,500 vaccinations. Do the math. It's, some of, it's their best year in 10 years when it comes to sustainability but it's not associated with the product. They don't buy and sell the product. The federal government paid for all that vaccine. That's the future model, y'all, okay? But if you put pressure on 177,000 pharmacists, a lot of people lost jobs at Walmart, Kroger, CVS, Walgreens, et cetera. Labor markets are labor markets. That's gonna put pressure on other places. If you're in a health system and you're saying to yourself, ah, I've done all this stuff. I went to school for four years and then another four years. And then I did two residencies and now I'm, you know, 67 with four kids and now I get a real, you know, real paying job and I'm safe and secure. Uh-uh. Not if community pharmacy gets impacted. If you don't think that there's going to be people with, with student debt and used to living on a lifestyle of six figures that aren't going to figure out a way to go get a residency or train themselves. And if you don't think C CFOs at health systems are going to say, if I can get cheaper labor for the same thing, of course I'm going to do that right? We all want pharmacist jobs to be growing, period, full stops. That's labor markets, okay? Go argue with an economist that it's different. It's not. So we're all in this together as a profession, okay? You're not just going to cleave off community pharmacy and not be affected. Myth number three, provider status will obviate the need to sustain community pharmacy practice. No, Right. So if we get provider status, we don't have to work in community pharmacies anymore because we'll all have great jobs in a clinic. Except that primary care providers can't even get jobs in clinics now, hardly. Right. Because that whole model's changing. All right. This I got from my, my wife got this in the mail. Talk to a phone by video, blah, 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 coming from United. She has United as a healthcare uh, provider. United Healthcare to send members kits with tests and Tamiflu. They just send them out. Right. They got somebody signing off on it. The primary care version of pharmacy mail order is here, y'all. It's called telemedicine. 
We certainly like to promote on the CPSN side, telelocal, which is a much different thing than telemedicine or telepharmacy from afar. So it's still got relationships associated with it. But yeah, of course, if you wanna do tele, video, uh, somebody, your delivery driver shows up at a house and you wanna do that, great, but it's based on relationships and local care delivery. But that model's changing. And uh, a lot of nurse practitioners, a lot of PAs, a lot of folks feel like, hey, we don't need primary care to take care of, of, of uh, complex issues. We need people to refer to specialists, okay? Uh, that's not me advocating one way or another, that's the trend. And the labor market for PAs and MPs is projected to go through the roof if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So we don't wanna, we don't wanna rely entirely on that model when you know, we're not all that much different as far as cost. Uh, from either physicians or MPs or PAs that can actually bill, right? Now, if we do get provider status, which the PrEP Amendment, ninth, uh, PrEP Declaration, Ninth Amendment on COVID allows pharmacists to test and treat. Test for COVID, treat with uh, Regeneron. That's 410 bucks sub Q in the pharmacy. It's 710 bucks if you go to their home and do it. That's real sustainability. My point is when you get provider status, you go to a fishing hole to catch fish. If all pharmacists in the country had provider status, I'd be setting up shop in a pharmacy. I'd be working with a pharmacist in a large practice because that's a very efficient way of operating. But I go, I'm gonna go to the place where I can build a practice quickly and efficiently because I have the opportunity to touch those patients 35 times a year. They're already there to pick up their beds. So product plus nothing is totally unsustainable. You're not gonna find an advocate in me for continuing on as we are now. That's a dead end, all right? No product and service, service is crowded. There's PAs, there's MPs, there's nurses, there's MAs. The most common CCM billing code on primary care right now for unsupervised care is a medical uh, assistant um, uh, in a call center somewhere, okay? So it's very crowded space, but if you take the product and the service together, that's, there's real differentiation there. There's a lot of people trying to get into pharmacy space in the value-based contracting world because they see the opportunity to grab the patient much more efficiently when you're doing pharmacy uh, dispensing services. So what we tell our pharmacies is, look, you're not a dispensary. You're a healthcare service provider that uses your dispensing as a unique way in the healthcare system to engage a patient. There's a big difference. And that is your, you know, and if as a profession, we fritter that away, crazy on us to do that, crazy. It's the thing that gives us the greatest vehicle to do value-based contracting. Primary care and no-shows and trying to reach out to patients and to engage them in care management, it's the biggest problem they have. It's not that they can't solve the problems, it's that they can't get the patients in or get the patients to do what they want them to do. It's not about the patients in your clinic today. It's about the patients that aren't your clinic that should be there. Guess where they're at? They're at the pharmacy every month. There's 60, 61 plus 4K compounding and other types of practice sites out there, right? Um, so the 35, 3.5 number was mostly complex Medicaid recipients on those care managed I talked about at CCNC, the folks at Pitt. Did the same analysis in Medicare 13 to seven when it comes to visits for complex patients, it's much more. Myth number four, lack of clinical competence is a barrier to community pharmacy sustainability. Uh, no, <laughs> okay. I work nights and weekends for 20 years. And again, I'm good at counseling. I haven't yet had a, that I know of, knock on wood, a dispensing error. Um, and if you said, Troy, I need you to open up a hypertension clinic, I'd say, give me three months. Give me a month. I can relearn JNC. I can do it well. Um, I can see patients. If you don't think that I have the talent to do that, I, I think you're wrong. It doesn't take that much to train pharmacists, people that have been trained. Changing the business model, the mindset, the motivations, and the workflow. Now that's hard. Okay? But it can be done. This is RX Clinic in Charlotte. Uh, Amina Abubakar is, is, is uh, an American gem. Um, anybody ever has the opportunity to go uh, meet and go to her pharmacy, 71% of their profits come from services. 71%. It's not of their gross revenue, profits. 
Okay, these are the practices that they work with where they've got a PharmD and a non-PharmD. This is the pharmacy working with the practice. 94% of patients with less than 9% A1C. There's a lot of systems, including Kaiser out there that would blush at that number, all right? We're certainly capable of it. That's, that's a minor issue compared to the business model issue and the marketplace issue, okay? And what, what it is that actually sustains the workflow. Myth number five, community pharmacists lack of focus uh, on healthcare service delivery is by choice. In other words, it's the blame the victim thing. Oh, you're a lowly community pharmacy. We look down at our nose at you because um, you've chosen to be this um, lick 'em, stick 'em sort of uh, pharmacist and you choose not to provide services. Uh, maybe in my cohort at the turn of the century, but that's not certainly how new graduates think. I, when I talk to owners that are trying to figure out how to, to uh, sell to young partners, they tell me one of the main reasons I wanna participate in CPSN is not to do the services myself. The main reason is the, the, the people I'm selling my pharmacy to so I can go to retirement, see a 20, 30, 40 year time horizon where they feel like they want to and they need to do clinical services to be sustainable. And they won't buy the pharmacy from me unless we're doing it. Okay, it's a business model problem. It's not a labor problem, y'all. It is not. The problem is that, you know, I save money. I get better clinical care by building bridges, but I get paid to build tunnels. Okay, if you pay based on buy, sell, and all this traditional way that we do reimbursement that has nothing to do actually with clinical outcomes, are you shocked that it's hard to build bridges? Does that mean that the pharmacies aren't capable of doing that? No, it means that the business model stinks and it needs to change. What used to be though is no longer. Could do CPSN when I graduated from, from uh, pharmacy school in 2002, couldn't be done. We could have all the same people today, all the same pharmacies, couldn't be done. Why? Because the pharmacies in the market weren't ready for it. But what used to be a uh, pharmacist shortage. I mean, I came to North Carolina in 2002 and I, I don't know how many different recruiters from, if I had a pulse and a clean record with the board, can you work the next 15 days? I mean, then emails, can, can you come here? Can you come here? Can you come here? Can you come here? I mean, that was the world in 2002, all right? Now we have a glut. Uh, you know, I'm not afraid to say it to students. I think the the potential future of pharmacy is exceptionally bright and COVID's pointed that out, but we have a glut and we have the biggest glut is people that maybe have something and they're under they're 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 it's they're sort of performing under where they want to clinically or what they want to do. So they might have a job or a part-time job. They're underemployed, so to speak, and they want to do these things. Right. So there's a there's a thirst and a, and a, and a labor supply available. There was healthy product margin, all right? A lot of people uh, wish they had gotten the COVID vaccine when they're on a respirator or a ventilator. A lot of people wish they'd quit smoking when they're diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, right? And that's, that's human nature. Hey, you need to change. You need to change pharmacy. You need to change, 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 change. Yeah, but man, I'm making money on product. That is a hard thing to get anybody to do. Go ask the oncology docs. They were making money on drug product for years. Oh, you're going to have to change. It's going to change. It's going to change. And now there's kind of a different model out there and they're struggling, right? Because when you're doing fine, it's hard to make changes. But now there's little or no product margin. Joe Muse told me the other year, he closed out his books. Last year, he said, I lost money on 70% of the patients that walk in my door. I sustain my pharmacy on 30% of the patients and it's the ones that are complex. There was no value-based contracting whatsoever. You would have been laughed out of the room as crazy town if you'd have said, hey, let's contract with a pharmacy network for A1C results outside of Asheville and the Asheville project, right? Which worked. The problem was it wasn't scalable. You couldn't get enough pharmacies to do it. You couldn't find enough employers to believe in it. It wasn't because they didn't do great things, right? But now there's actual marketplace. What we're finding in the marketplace is plans are saying, 
we don't care where the outcomes come from. Primary care, health systems, PT, nutritionists, pharmacies. Hey, if you can deliver on these outcomes, you can deliver on our deliverables, we'll contract with you. That's a sea change in the environment. There was no inflow workflow documentation. So we'd make people jump into 58 different systems. We do that now today still, um, but at least at CPSN, we, we work with 18 different pharmacy management systems and clinical utilities to have a single way of collecting A1C, blood pressure, drug therapy problems, um, uh, now PHQ-9 screenings and these types of things. Is it you know perfect or even mature? No, but these systems are now being built and they're starting to mature a little bit. That's a change. Pharmacy services were kind of taboo. We'd always be walking on eggshells out there. Hey, genuflecting to the health system lobbyist or the AMA lobbyist or whatever else. It's just not the environment anymore. Pharmacy services are preferred. Um, we've got pharmacies, great example. Hey, you guys test. We don't want to test at our primary care clinic. You guys make sure you're doing the shingles vaccination. It's a quality measure for us, but it's a pain in the butt. You guys do this stuff. Let's work closely together on the stuff we want to do. You do what you're good at. That stuff's happening a lot now. Okay. So it's not like some taboo thing anymore for pharmacies and pharmacists to do the services. So those are the myths. And certainly would encourage you to enter, uh, put questions in the question box because well, we'll try to leave 10 minutes here at the end. Um, but I wanna sort of dive now into what does a future pharmacy look like? And, and, and uh, yeah. visually it actually looks roughly the same. I think there's a lot of people that are like, they think of the physical aesthetic, look, here's the pharmacy of the future and they rearrange things and so on and so forth. And there's some value to that. And, and it's legitimate sort of rearrangement. But really it's about people, workflow, market expectations and patient expectations and flow. Not really the physical way you set up a pharmacy. Yes, you do need a kind of private area, semi-private area, no question about that. But a physical layout, if you focus entirely on that, forget it, you're not gonna get transformation. What, when we partner with Community Pharmacy Foundation, there's over a thousand pharmacies now enrolled in this Flip the Pharmacy program that we're getting some empirical data that it, it works, that we're the, the measures, care plans, A1Cs, blood pressures uh, for Flip the Pharmacy uh, participants far outpace those that aren't in the program. Um, these were the six that were identified <clears throat> and they've held now over two years. No one sort of said, nah, I really think it's not really three. I think there's a seventh or anything like that. People just look at this and they go, yeah, that's it. Um, number one, and, and perhaps most importantly, leveraging the appointment-based model. So an appointment-based model says, you know, community pharmacies are the most accessible healthcare setting in the country and in the system. But it also, that accessibility also creates one of the biggest barriers, which is patient comes in, they need help with a service that's going to take 15 minutes. That's a logistics and workflow problem, especially if they're coming in Monday morning at 930 when you're 200 prescriptions behind. The big, 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 big deal with synchronizing medications and doing appointments is that you can actually prep for patients just like you would as a primary care provider or a surgeon or anybody else in the system. So you're getting the duality of the access and the appointments for patients that are most likely to need services. Even the CDC for the 21 of us that are in the Federal Retail Pharmacy Partnership where we get our vaccines from the CDC allocated to the, our pharmacies, there, there isn't a week that goes by that they don't say, we wanna see your scheduling system, how you're doing appointments, et cetera. And that's for a pretty simple three to five minute service, right? So it's critical that you get patients into this predictable when they pick up their medicines. And then you're using that as a Trojan horse for here's the services that go with it. The problems we've found, taking your blood pressure, uh, counseling you on your A1C or whatever else, right? So it starts with this. And what we believe is you can't do any of the other stuff successfully until you have this in place. And again, testing and mass immunizations. One of the biggest IT advancements in the history of community pharmacy was spawned by COVID vaccinations. On the independent pharmacy side, at least, of which there's about 20,000, I'm going to guess there was maybe 
couple hundred, maybe a thousand pharmacies that had a scheduling system on their website or any kind of scheduling system at all beyond filling on the sink. They all have them now. That's one of the effects of COVID. And if you talk to them, they say, wait a second, why am I not doing this for my sink, my vaccinations, my MTM appointments? I can queue all this up. Yeah. You know what that sounds like? A practice, <laughs> right? And they're having this kind of realization like, okay, yeah, this isn't so in the abstract now, this can be done, right? And it actually makes my pharmacy operate more efficiently so I don't have people backed up on a Monday morning because they're not following the typical consumer patterns now. Two, improving patient follow-up and monitoring, the biggest lost opportunity in pharmacy. Everybody else in the system, lack of engagement, loss to follow-up is the biggest problem on clinical outcomes, right? Look at SSRIs really critical that you monitor and titrate on SRIs, right? Go low, go slow. By definition, you need follow-up week, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, maybe longer, right? And you can you know, extend that clinical example to all sorts of therapies and all sorts of things. And here we are in the pharmacy getting, touching these patients all the time. Imagine if your primary care or your behavioral health trying to, like, am I going to, are they going to answer the phone when we call? Am I going to follow up? Who's going to follow up? you know, all those sorts of things. So we do a really crappy job of the thing that we could be best at in community pharmacy, right? Somebody shows up at the counter, we do some generic counseling thing, right? But if I know that we said, hey, your A1C was 9.3 last month. Here's what we did. We moved from two a day to three a day. Um, and how's that going? One, that's patient-centeredness. And the patient's like, whoa, they're paying attention and I'm getting some real engagement here. This makes me happy. Satisfaction scores are a quality measure. Two, I'm actually having a meaningful conversation where I'm following up and I'm tracking, right? Well, no, here's what happened. That you know, I end up going and getting this, you know, mail order uh, sub Q thing. Oh, well, we need to reevaluate and figure out what's going on here so we can set for the next time. You know what the rest of the world calls that? Charting and plans of care. Everybody in the world does care planning except community pharmacies. You know what the other name for a care plan is in pharmacy world? The pharmacist care process endorsed by the joint commission of, uh, of the joint uh, pharmacy associations, right? We just need to do it in the pharmacy and it doesn't have to be super complicated. These care plans can be put together in two, three, four minutes. Uh, it's no more time than any other healthcare provider. Uh, and, you know, somebody grabs the chart, what's going on, two or three minutes, you can hear them outside the door, right? You can hear them out there. They pick up the chart, you're waiting those Okay, what's going on? What happened last time? What's the chief complaint? They're not spending an hour, okay? And then when they chart, they're either talking into a voice recorder, so there's transcriptionists doing it, or what they complain about incessantly now, rightly so, is I have to now go home and chart at night, which they hate, right? But if they see 25 patients in a day, most of them do, they're doing 25 care plans in like an hour, right? It can be done. We're no different than the rest of the healthcare system. And you need to know what you said, what was the plan of care the last time you met with them. We need to develop new roles in non-pharmacist support staff. Who's the transcriptionist in the pharmacy entering those care plans? Don't have a pharmacist do it, right? Unless it's, you know, they're right there and it's real simple. If you need to write something up, don't be, you know, we would call pharmacies. Hey, how's it going when you're calling and reaching out for patients low on PDC or that they need their care plans done or blah, blah, blah. Well, it just takes me a long time to call them. Whoa, whoa, time out. Okay, you, you've got how much training and you've got, and you're doing what, <laughs> right? Right, you know, you don't have physicians calling patients, right? There's people to do that stuff. We need to develop those roles in the pharmacy and get rid of the term pharmacy technician. One, it's degrading. And two, we need to elevate those folks. We tell pharmacies now, why are you competing in a labor market with McDonald's? That's on the stupid pile. You need to develop people, pay them a little bit more so they save you a bunch of time and you're more likely to keep them in a tight labor market, all right? 70 to 90% of the tax required really shouldn't be done by the pharmacist. Get rid of the term technician. These systems have care planning now. They can drill down, run reports on patients. They can do IVR outreach and follow up, automated sort of responses. Just inertia and in getting pharmacies to actually use the bells and the whistles in the systems they actually have now is one of the big barriers. Establishing working relationships with other care team members. Remember, this whole journey on the CPSN side, for me, when somebody said, go do this thing, started with, 
my skepticism <laughs> that that was possible. And turns out the relationships actually are already there. The part that needs work is the working efficient and effective part. If they're gonna be working jointly on contracts and outcomes and these types of things. And yes, there's collaborative practice agreements, great. But we also have this concept of, uh, that we've kind of taken from other arenas on care compacts. Because for a lot of this stuff, you don't need to be prescribing or titrating or any of that stuff. It's great, nice to have, should be the future. But a lot of this is just care complex that are protocols. If, if, if I find this, this is who I reach out to in a practice. If I find this, this is what I do. And I put you know, data in or I refer to the food bank. We do a lot of social determinants kinds of stuff now. All right. And then of course the ultimate motivator is one through five are never gonna happen. They're never gonna be sustainable unless you start actually building out a business model, okay? It requires a different way of doing business and thinking. I'll give you a good example of this. There was a, a, an opportunity in an upper Midwest state to do a uh, program where uh, they were gonna get paid 50, 80, 120 bucks for various kinds of activities. And one of the owners of a regional chain uh, called me and said, hey, <laughs> I want to do these services, but this reimbursement uh, that's coming from their PBM is horrible. So I'm losing money on the, on the PBM side. And I said, well, tell you what, if you give me your data on what you purchase price and what you sell at on reimbursement and what your costs are, I will come back to you with an analysis of if you'd adopt and optimize this care process uh, in this billing, what your net effect would be. And basically they got a little bit more dispensing uh, fee associated with doing the clinical services from the PBM, which was modest, but important. Uh, but when you added the clinical stuff, they actually, <laughs> it actually increased their per dispensing, uh, not in terms of here's what I build for because they don't understand, it doesn't compute when you're living in a world of, of what am I reimbursed for every pill uh, bottle going out the door. If you've been doing that for 50 years, that's the way you think. But when we put it in terms of if you do this many percentage of patients on these clinical activities, here's what it costs for you to do the clinical activities, run through the business model, which I'd love for the schools to help pharmacies start thinking differently in these models and these business models. They were actually going to make three to five dollars more per prescription, which actually put them in the black instead of the red. OK, but I put it in terms that they understood. You have to think about this stuff differently. and We got to get them thinking more about services and what that model looks like from a business perspective and sustainability. So what does victory look like? You know, are we gonna suffer from it look good on a whiteboard, <laughs> right? Or is it out there and is it actually working? I would say in some ways it's working too well, <laughs> in some ways it's not working well enough. Um, where it's working almost too well is we've, we've got so many different smaller pilot projects out there that it's hard to keep track of them, administer them, facilitate them, make sure they're successful because they're, you know, they're, it's a lot of smalls, right? So we've got, a, you know, uh, 127 grapes out there and it's easier to manage, you know, five or 10 watermelons, frankly, right? Um, but Look, 95% of programs result in payment to the pharmacies um, across Medicare public programs, mostly because that's where the complex programs where a lot of the existing Medicare Advantage stars, medical side measures, HEDIS measures, withholds at the state and so on and so forth um, um, are, are, are at. Um, smaller programs, 166,000 in payments, uh, opportunities across you know, 20 or 30 pharmacies. Uh, we do have some nationals though too, where there are thousands of pharmacies with opportunities. Um, but we're in this kind of phase of where the catalyzing part's done. We've sort of feel like we were helpful to the marketplace saying, hey, here's what you can do and how you can work with community pharmacies. Now we're in the sort of testing competitive, smaller amounts. And then what we're hoping we see happens, of course, is that watermelons enter big numbers of pharmacies, big numbers of dollars, bigger risk reward opportunities that are out there. So it has to be scaled, measurable and meaningful. So for us, we're the fourth largest chain in the country by single signature. Um, and these are the pharmacies that vaccinate. I mean, you're covering, we cover uh, over 80% of the US population by service area, 10 miles in urban and 30 miles in rural. Um, big, big, big presence in rural, 
Um, that's the number of uh, CPSN pharmacies with a CLIA waiver. And now it's almost basically the red because of COVID, right? So there's, you know, there's more pharmacies with a CLIA waiver now than not. Think about that. More pharmacies that can test and more and more pharmacies now that can treat um, gigantic increases in numbers post-COVID than pre-COVID. Um, these are the ACT uh, schools of pharmacy. What's your role? Practice transformation, program evaluation, business models, learners as, as positive deviants, as Curtis Haas at Rochester Medical Center would say, um, uh, the ability to go in and, and positively contaminate pharmacies towards a new model of workflow. Um, we, there are more pharmacies ready to quit smoking than ever that I've seen it. In other words, providers are no different than patients, okay? It's behavior, it's outlook, right? And if I'm not ready to quit smoking, it's not gonna happen. If I'm not ready to come off of the opioids, it's not gonna happen. And so for a long, long time, we had people that just were natural leaders out there, a couple hundred pharmacies doing great things. And then a whole bunch of people that like, oh yeah, I know I've been told not to smoke anymore, but I'm still smoking because it feels good and I'm making money. Guess what? I'm not making money anymore. And now there's thousands and thousands of pharmacies saying, okay, I'm either gonna sell or I'm gonna quit smoking, but I need help quitting smoking. So if I'm a school or a college of pharmacy, and I got five, 10, 15, 20 years ago, yeah, yeah, whatever in my preceptor sites, but I don't really, I'm telling you that you should reapproach those folks and say, hey, do we wanna do something different here now? Because there's a lot more people ready to quit smoking. And, and the system needs, whether it's CPSN or not, needs the colleges and the schools and the learners and the faculty to, to cultivate this so that we're at scale. So what if 2,500 pharmacies took 10 blood pressures a day. We're 3,500 pharmacies now. What's somebody get, get out your calculators, right? What's 2,500 times 10, right? Not a hard calculation. 25,000. 10 blood pressures a day is not hard, especially if you have a student <laughs> or a resident in the, in the pharmacy, right? And Bo, by the way, half of the blood pressures that we start, that our first 40,000 blood pressures submitted to us in Flip the Pharmacy, half were out of range. Half of those people that were out of range didn't have a blood pressure medicine, didn't have a primary care provider. Uh, one of the big futures of community pharmacy is screening for brief intervention, referral, and treatment. SBIRT for hypertension, SBIRT for uh, A1C, SBIRT for depression, right? 10 blood pressures a day. That's 10 million blood pressures a year, 10 million. What if half of them were out of range and half of them could be fixed by coaching alone? Hey, we had a blood pressure, you took it, you didn't. What's going on with this? Half could be a regimen change, sometimes maybe under protocol, sometimes independently, sometimes in partnership. That's millions of more patients, right? That's hard to ignore as a policy person, scale matters. Covering a state, this is CPSN Kansas. They cover most of the population of the state. Now we're talking. If each one of those stars can actually help me as a plan or a legislator or whatever, move the needle in a meaningful way, it's not, there's a good story about one pharmacy down the road, right? Um, this is HEDIS measures uh, in Pennsylvania, kudos to PPCN up there. HEDIS measures are, are really important to Medicaid, uh, and other types of organizations, 100% at goal for blood pressure, right? So a pharmacy working with a practice, a network of pharmacies working with a plan, the red is network and the blue is the average for the MCO. It works if you actually give the community pharmacy an actual reasonable opportunity, okay? Here's actual programs that are in place. Diabetes, intervention, basically the care plan. What are the goals? A med rec, what are the problems? What's the plan of care? What's the A1C? What's going on with them? Blood pressure, et cetera. Port that in a care plan, 60 to $80 per member per month. That's a very common thing in value-based contracts. So you're getting, depending on their complexity, 
that recurring revenue in an appointment-based model, but you get a withhold. Hey, we're going to take some of that money off the table until we see those numbers move. That sounds a lot like an accountable care organization on the medical side. Yeah, exactly. Same concept, clinically integrated network on the pharmacy side. Um, again, these are one of the 27 that are out there. Asthma program, this one's really interesting. Uh, intervention, we don't care, whatever works. We got, we're a plan in the South that's got a ton of kids going to the ED. It's our big problem. Data reporting, we don't want data. Only thing we care about is claims coming from the ED. That's gonna determine the economic and the human outcomes from our perspective. We'll pay you a nominal $10 per member per month to give you something. But we're gonna give you 65% of the savings against benchmark or baseline for the ED savings. That can add up pretty quickly if you can actually have an effect. So two kind of wildly different ways of doing programs, but meaningful, real programs, not you know check the box, pat the bat, log, you know, log into some system, nothing ever really actually happens. There's no follow-up or anything meaningful that really happens, right? These are, these are legitimate, looks like medical side types of arrangements. So again, how do we get there? We, when we worked with the Community Pharmacy Foundation, they said, Troy, we need a big idea. I said, well, the big problem right now is not innovation, okay? We got innovation everywhere in community pharmacy. What we don't have is scale, right? As John Easter, a colleague here at UNC would say, Pharmacy is really good at one in a rose. We do something, hey, look at this great thing we did, and then it's dead. We're, we got to focus on implementation scale, okay? So CPSN, amongst others out there, grouping pharmacies together, trying to get them to do different things. You got ACT, the schools, right? Learners as innovator, uh, learners as teachers, teachers as innovators. Flip the pharmacy, the practice transformation. What are we trying to do? We're trying to take those folks that have innovated and learn from there, not invent something new. There's already people doing innovative things. Take what they did and figure out how to get more pharmacies to do that. That is the goal. That is the key thing in community pharmacy right now. That should be the focus of our time, energy, and funding when it comes to uh, the profession, when it comes to community pharmacy. A um, couple quick notes on COVID. Public awareness and expectations of pharmacies have changed. When you see Congressional leaders come on to cable news and say, hey, it won't be long before you can go down to your local pharmacy. That's a culture change. That's a big culture change. That means that it's okay to say, oh, pharmacies, and that there's a realization that, oh, well, that's the logical place to go get your vaccination, of course, and your service, right? Uh, point of care testing becoming much, much more prominent. We have a pharmacy in Buffalo is doing over a thousand COVID tests a day, right? Uh, scheduling utilities adopted, we talked about that. And then service dollars get, are generating total margin. There's no DIR fees, rebate games, whatever else with services. <clears throat> and then finally, a big shout out to the community pharmacies out there. Uh, there's already FOIA requests, freedom of information requests going to the CDC and HHS because we have to respond to them. And I am really looking forward to the stories coming from this. Our data tells us that community pharmacies serve the patients in their communities. That is to say that community pharmacies, particularly independents and particularly at CPSN, tend to be in underserved, underprivileged communities, and that they provided vaccinations to those communities. That's what this data tells you. That is not the case for other settings of care and other uh, endeavors when the vaccines okay, were released. So I think there's going to be some really fascinating uh, sort of data that says, hey, when we think about underserved communities, engaging those communities and serving those communities, we really ought to think of community pharmacies. All right, that's all I got. Five minutes for questions. Sorry, uh, Rosa or others, if uh, uh, I don't know if anything, it doesn't look like anything came in the chat box, but I'll certainly be willing to entertain some questions. Yes, uh, Troy. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Bill Bird. I'm an alum of the college here. I've excellent. followed your work for many years and I think it's an excellent presentation. I've been beating the drum uh, after uh, years in various types of pharmacy practice on the provider status. And I know you're very in step with what's going on. What is, as an old man getting ready to go out the other side at some point in the next 20 years, what hope do I have for this in pharmacy? Uh, I think your biggest opportunity is craft beer. <laughs> and that's, 
<laughs> right? I mean, like you've probably heard me talk about before, right? So as, as, a, as tra trained in economics, you, you, know, you think, you try to apply analogies, right? So, so the thing about craft beer is that when we saw craft beer take off, we, um, the reason, it's not that craft beer hasn't been around for a hundred years, okay? It's that there was an inflection point when it changed consumer expectations, right? So it's not like progressive pharmacy practice, perhaps like yours, hasn't been around for a long time. It's when do you get to the inflection point when the consumers, because that's what drives plans and policy more than anything else. When consumers say, you know what? I want my vaccine from a pharmacy. I just want to go down to the pharmacy and get tested. I just want to go down to the pharmacy and have them look at my blood pressure and figure out my mess of meds. And when that happens, policy and opportunities follow, right? So it doesn't mean we stop our efforts federally. It doesn't mean we stop our efforts in the traditional way and advocacy in the state. But one of the things that COVID's done and that we really need to start thinking about now at scale is how we go straight out to patients and consumers and say, we are a healthcare service provider. You are being harmed by not being able to come to me to provide a service to you. That's how most things get covered in healthcare. They don't get covered by an ROI analysis or we do A1Cs better than everyone else. Usually it's, I want, a, I want something covered. I'm harmed. I don't have access to it until somebody pays for it. Thank you. You bet. Keep up the good fight. Dr. Trickstead, can you go back to the slide that has your email information on it, please? A student requested to see it. And then we also had a question come in Did the I chat. Have it? <laughs> Let me see if I can find it. Um, I'm not sure. If it's not on there, I, I can email it out to everybody. Yeah, I can put it in the chat box right away. Perfect. We also had a question come through. What do you see as the key knowledge skills of new pharmacy graduates to operate successfully in Community Pharmacy 2.0? I, I think your biggest advantage is you tend to be fearless and naive, and that could be a big advantage. Um, and what I mean by that is, is uh, 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 inertia is real. So we have, you know, folks, uh, you know, and what we just discussed that from the beginning, probably, and for a long time, they have instilled in them sort of a, hey, there's a different way to do things. But when you're starting fresh, you have the ability to do things differently and think, think differently, right? So that's your biggest advantage. I think your biggest disadvantage and why I wish the schools and colleges would do a little more of is teaching you how the healthcare system is financed, um, understanding how value-based contracting works, um, how outcomes are measured, um, uh, uh, how um, uh, con you know, contracting uh, in 2021 works, uh, what the effect of networks. And a lot of that comes from, if you have the opportunity to do like a, a residency or a rotation in a medical ACO or a medical CIN is learning and seeing how it's done there. Don't just siphon yourself off and just do the clinical stuff. Say, hey, how does it work? How do you guys get paid? Uh, what kind of contracts do you have? And how does that work? And how does my work over here translate? Whether you're wanting to be a pharmacist in a clinic or, or you want to be a pharmacist in community pharmacy, understanding how all of that works. And so that when you think about how you want to implement a practice model is within that context would be my biggest um, recommendation. So we are at one o'clock and seeing no other questions in the chat. I just want to say thank you so much for your presentation today and thank you everyone for attending. Um, Dr. Trixit's email is in the chat now. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you for having me and, and um, support your students and your alumni that have crazy ideas about community pharmacy services, please. There's another comment for you in the chat box. Oh, sure. I think it was just a comment. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. And um, again, look forward to follow up. And uh, I will see any, anybody uh, down the road in the future. Perfect. Thanks.